Right. It's a perfect fight for that card. They needed to beef up the card. Cerrone just fought last week. Ferguson, everyone misses him. I mean, I would be shocked if that fight is boring, if that fight does not live up to all our expectations. We're up against the break here, but I really appreciate the call, Berto, and I hope to see you in Chicago because, like I said, I have something very special for everyone, so I hope that if you are attending, you'll be there uh, Friday because something fun is in the works for all of you. But yes, Ferguson Cerrone is huge. Number one contender fight, potentially McGregor fight next. Potentially, there's a lot to like there. But just from an actual fight perspective, it's phenomenal. I love that fight. I can't wait for it. And it's amazing. It's happening in 28 days. One slight correction. Uh, this won't be a 25-minute fight because it's not the main event. So it's just a 15-minute fight. It also isn't the shortest turnaround in his UFC career. He once uh, had just 15 days in between fights, which is just absurd. And by the way, won both of those, beat Miles Jury and also beat uh, Benson Henderson. Did not get injured in that fight against Ally Quinto. We know he likes to be active. We know he doesn't like to sit around. He tried to get the Conor McGregor fight, and it's just not materializing right now for him. And so he essentially said, let's keep going. And uh, the beauty in this for him, if he still wants the Conor McGregor fight, I mean, this fight is in 28 days. So it's not like Conor's going to get booked in that time or uh, going to be off the market, in, in my opinion. And so you can pick up another paycheck like he did against... I like Quinta and be fresh as a daisy if it all works out. Now, typically, Tony Ferguson fights, you don't leave fresh as a daisy, but I get the thinking on his part. He doesn't want to slow down. He's 3-0 and as a dad. It's a huge fight for him, and quite frankly, it might be a number one contender fight. Now, I think that a Conor fight generates more money than a title fight at this point. Conor is a title in his own right, um, but for him, for this fight to materialize this quickly and he wants to be active and he wasn't hurt, I think it it's no harm, no foul. It's a great opportunity for him. So I like it. And I know everyone in Chicago, and they needed to beef up that card. They really did. Even though there's two title fights on it, they really felt the need to do so. So why the heck not? Uh, yeah, so my question for you is, uh, what division do you think the UFC needs more right now? A uh, 165-pound division or 195-pound division? 100% it's 165. Uh, there aren't enough guys at 195 to justify it. Uh, I wouldn't even advocate for a 195 right now. I would go 155, 165, 175. So bump Usman up to 75, then go 185, 205 heavyweight. 195 maybe in the future, but there's just not enough guys for 195. 165, there are enough guys right now. Kevin Lee, Nate Diaz, Jorge Masvidal. They would all jump at the opportunity to fight at 165. So that would be it if you ask me. And Dana really doesn't want that 165 belt really doesn't want it uh, for whatever reason. And it makes no sense to me. I've been talking about this for a while. Uh, like you're, you're, you're so eager to put together these interim title fights. I don't understand why you're so against the 165 pound title, which actually makes sense. And there's a market for it. And there's a demand for it from your fighters who are kind of stuck. Some of them between 155 and 170, they can't find that sweet spot. Like Nate Diaz would 100% be all over a 165 title, to, to name a few. But I just don't think it's happening. I, I really don't. In 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 the immediate future, like by the time this whole thing is said and done and we're all old and gray, there will be a 165-pound title. I feel very strongly about that. I feel like it will happen. It only makes sense. Why do you jump from 55 to 70 and then to 185? It doesn't make sense. Go 55, 65, 75, 80. 85 that i mean that's just too perfect but november msg seems a little too soon just a little too soon i was going to talk to you about brock as far as uh, him pulling out of the dc conversation do you know what happened with that because he was getting you solid tested and you know he was it looked all set to go and then suddenly it just pulls out so do you have any like inside info on that in terms of brock and usada no just with him pulling out of the dc fight I mean, he didn't pull out. The fight was never a done deal. Um, and uh, they, they were talking. There was something on the table. And in the end, they just could not come to terms. And I think part of it is the new pay-per-view structure, the fact that the pay-per-views are exclusively on ESPN+. Plus, um, and, and it just changes things. And there's going to be a bit of a, a learning curve. There's going to be some growing pains because you're now changing people's spending habits and just their their routine after all these years. And so they could not come to terms. Brock has done this in the past. He's negotiated publicly in the past, has let rumors, you know, sort of linger in the past and then goes back to WWE. And that's essentially what he did here. And I suspect this is the end of the Brock Lesnar UFC relationship. Not to say that they ended it on bad terms, but just he's getting up there in age. And, and really, I mean, it was kind of crazy to even think that this fight made any sense whatsoever other than 
business sense, which I get, but he should not have been in talks to fight Daniel Cormier. That's that's just absurd. It's an absolute sham. So all's well that ends well for for Stipe Miocic for the sanctity of the belt. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, I had nothing to do with USADA, had nothing to do with him pulling out necessarily. They just could not come to terms on a deal for this fight given the new pay-per-view structure. That's essentially it. Okay, so we're assuming here, and thank you very much for the call, Mike. We're assuming here that uh, John Jones is going to be Tiago Santos July 6th, and we'll also assume for a second that Daniel Cormier is going to beat Steve Miocic on August 17th. I think if both win, they'll try to get DC to fight one more time and fight John Jones. If he says no for whatever reason, and he told me on Monday that the only way he fights John Jones is if it's at 205 and not heavyweight, because in his mind, he feels as though, all right, this guy beat me twice at 205. I have to beat him at 205 in order to justify all of this. Uh, quite frankly, I disagree with him, but that's why we all love DC because he's an ultimate competitor and he doesn't feel as though it's a legit win if he doesn't beat him at 205. If I'm John Jones, I say, screw that. I'm going up to heavyweight and I'm going to take away your belt there and pretty much erase your entire legacy. But let's just say, okay, they figure it out. December might be a little quick, but I think it's possible if DC doesn't take the John Jones fight, if they can't get it done, then I would look to Luke Rockhold to be next for John Jones. Luke Rockhold is fighting Jan Blachowicz on that same July 6 card. There are not a lot of big name contenders at 205 right now. Rockhold, a former champion at middleweight, has now moved up to 205. They want to put together that fight. So if they can't get the DC fight done, they want to give him a little more time. And Rockhold looks good in his debut July 6. I would suspect that they're going to make Rockhold Jones later on this year. And John Jones wants to fight at least one more time this year. In, in your opinion, where does he stand the better chance at light heavyweight or at heavyweight? Second part of my question is outside of DC, who's the most intriguing matchup for John Jones? Wow. Um, I think he has a better chance at heavyweight. I think Daniel Cormier is healthier at heavyweight, powerful, um, more powerful at heavyweight. And of course he's only lost to one guy at light heavyweight, but he's undefeated at heavyweight. So I would give him the nod at heavyweight. I understand why he wants to do it at light heavyweight because he's that kind of a competitor. But if I had to advise him, I would say stick, stick to heavyweight. I mean, at this point you're like walking around at 250 pounds. It's just crazy to cut down. As far as next for Jones, I'm looking at Luke Rockhold if he wins on July 6th. I don't know about you, but I've loved this tear of Jose Aldo just going and working all the top contenders in the division. If he does so with Volkanovski tonight, what's your dream matchup for all those next fights? Man, you know, I like I like that Connor idea. Um, and of course, anyone against Connor is fun, but him trying to get another crack at Connor um, after what Connor did to him, because I remember the way he, you know, he was crying in the back, the way he was so devastated. It, it just felt like, to me, I am so happy about the fact that the first line atop Aldo's resume when it's all said and done when they write the story on him it won't be the 13 second loss because i feel like at a time it was trending in that direction and it was it was kind of sad it bummed me out because he's done so much more he's been so important in, in, in the growth of this sport and in my opinion the greatest featherweight champion of all time and he has done a very good job of distancing himself from that loss and so it would be cool to see him get another crack at it because enough time has passed um but I, I don't think Connor's going to take that fight. But if, if you ask me, because right now there's nothing going on really for Connor, that would be a lot of fun. It would be cool to see him try to right that wrong, if you will. My question really for you is, uh, is Ben Askren going to finally like show us the real Ben Askren against Jorge Masvidal? Or is Masvidal going to uh, show us that Ben Askren doesn't really belong with the elite of the UFC? Who's the real Ben Askren, though? Well, the undefeated MMA fighter Ben Askren. Yeah. From one FC and Bellator, not from USC, and his almost debacle against Robbie Lawler. All right. I get your point, Ben. Thank you for the call. I mean, look, that, that did not start out well, but all's well that ends well, and it was sort of the perfect ending um, for his UFC debut because he has ruffled so many feathers. Uh, this is an interesting matchup. Apparently, they have trained together in the past, and Ben got the best of Jorge Masvidal. So we'll see what happens. Masvidal is is, is riding high these days. His confidence is is tremendously high. Um, ben is a tough wrestler, of course. His striking certainly not at the level of his wrestling. So we'll see what happens as far as him trying to get Masvidal down to the ground. But I think it's a really tough matchup for Ben. I also think it's a tough matchup for Masvidal, and those are the best ones. 
Well, 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 listen, listen. I mean, nothing, no, and when I say nothing, I mean nothing is bigger in this world than the press conference between the Russian hammer, Artem Lobov, <laughs> and Paul Malinaji Lewis. I mean, come on, this is hot off the press. Yeah, well, I mean, look, it was fun. It was, at the very, it's entertaining no matter what way you want to slice it. Yeah, Paulie Malinaji comes off like a fucking, uh, whatever. I mean, I, he comes off a little bit like a meathead. Um, but it was kind of fun to watch. It, you kind of want to watch these guys go to it. It seems passionate. My, my problem with Paul Malinaji is it doesn't, it doesn't seem legitimate. He doesn't seem like he actually hates Artem Lobov. He seems like he's just wanting to sort of walk the walk and, and sort of like, you know, sound like a tough guy. But where does the hatred for Artem Lobov come from? Well, 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 first and foremost, I got to say this. And maybe you're right, Lewis, and you probably are. You know, maybe it's a little manufactured. Perhaps we can, I know it's audio only, but is it p possible that at this point on the audio only on YouTube, we can insert an image of a fedora hat. I'm going to tell you this right now. You're not feeling poorly because of all the bullshit that he's saying, the things that he's doing. And don't get me started on spitting on him. Any motherfucker that shows up wearing a hat like that deserves to die. It's as simple as that. Jesus. I'm sorry. You look like an absolute tit, okay? He looks like a, a, a villain out of the Dick Tracy movie. You know what I mean? He might as well have had a, a pinstripe suit on, that big, stupid gangster hat. Oh, my God. He did not look good. I'm sorry. Maybe I don't get it. Maybe I'm not, you know, Italian from Brooklyn or whatever the fuck you say, Polly. You know, maybe that's their thing. But I'm telling you, you look like a twat. And any man that runs around, I don't care if you're at the beach. I don't care if you're uh, whatever pastime you are taking part in. If you go out wearing a fedora, you are a cock. It's plain and simple. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, like an old black man at church? Pass. He gets it. He gets He's it. allowed. He's okay. It's a cultural thing. It's an age thing. It's 2019. Okay. If you wear a pair of modern shoes, you don't get to wear a fedora. Okay. If yeah. you're turning up to a press conference wearing a fedora oh god follow my analogy let me spit in your face jesus christ yeah he's spitting his face um which yeah i mean look low blow uh very yeah but look we're it's it's making me excited to watch it we you know the, this is not we are talking about this is what they did right we can talk all the shit all we want they did a good job because now the number one MMA podcast in the world, highlights used by actual UFC, ESPN promos, uh, they actually have us speaking about this and they're getting the press that they want on it. People right now are clicking on the YouTube video. They're hearing about his gay hat and the fact that he spit in his face and this you know crazy press conference. They're going to go and watch that now. Um, and in a weird way, you know, bare knuckle boxing is i have a little bit of respect for how they just sort of came out of nowhere and they're making some noise they're making some noise in the fight world uh, well you know let's not get into that we've spoke about this before but listen you, you're right they are attracting headlines uh artem lobov you know i mean listen he, he didn't do too well in the ufc and i'm I, i'm i'm trying to be respectful i'm not trying to be disrespectful i'm not you know but he struggled that's a fact um now, in a straight-up boxing match, he's going against a former world champion like Pauli Malinaji. Now, he has been out for a while. So, you know, let's see what version of Malinaji shows up. But this is very personal. And when it's this personal, you do push yourself in the training room, you know, and, and you give it your all. So, uh, it's an interesting fight. I mean, listen, on paper, um, you got, you got to think Malinaji is going to run right through him. But going back to what you said... You're right. You're right. I mean, it's funny because a lot of people talk about how in mixed martial arts, they want to move away from the entertainment factor. And they're saying, oh, it's great. Now that Connor's not around so much, we're moving away from that. And now it's becoming more about the sport and more about respect and all the rest of it. But scandal and, and behavior like that, it sells. It's as simple as that. Now, maybe in its purest form, it would be nice. If people went up and they shook their hand and, and they bow and they fire their hearts out and then they hug each other and embrace. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. It's really cool. But I'd rather watch a fight with two people absolutely hate each other. They're spitting in each other's faces beforehand because I'm like, shit, get the popcorn. 
this yeah. is going to be good. So you're right, Lewis. Fair play to them. Yeah, I can't I can't hate on it. And, you know, look, Artem didn't have a, an unbelievable career in the UFC, uh, but he's an entertaining fighter. Paul Malignaggi, you know, we were talking about Nate Diaz being out for a while and how much this is going to affect him. And Paul Malignaggi, he hasn't fought since March 2017. He hasn't had a win since July of 2016. So it's a you know, similar thing. Two years since he's fought. More than two years since he's fought. And going on three years since he's had a win. Um, Artem Lobov, he's just fought very knuckle boxing. He's been an active UFC fighter. Been fighting for high level fights for a very very long time right now I've been very active so that might be a, a major factor here as well so the experience with just boxing uh, goes to Paul Malignaggi but you have Artem Lobov who has also been super super active and you know I I, I, I kind of want to see it for the first time I'm actually interested in watching a bare knuckle boxing fight so I have to say good for them for actually doing a good job promoting it because there's a little bit of interest here um, I just as as my son's getting older, he's six years old now. Like I'm getting into watching fighting with him now. I couldn't watch that with him. It's guaranteed that you're going to see these nasty fucking cuts on their you know their faces. It's a really brutal, brutal sport. So uh, that's sort of the downside of that sport that I see. Whereas like the mixed martial arts has almost become like. It's almost become a family sport. It's crazy to say, dude. Where it started from, where it's at now, I don't think it's weird to have a seven-year-old kid at a mixed martial arts event or watching a mixed martial arts event, especially if the, you know their family's involved in the sport in one way or another. Um, but bare knuckle boxing is a little bit too brutal for kids to be watching. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I had uh, Lucas in the octagon uh, in 2015 <laughs> when I fought Talis Lightis. Callum came into the ring after a bunch of my fights, after I won my fights, and he was there live. Uh, so, yeah, I, and you're right. It is bizarre to think that UFC now has become a family sport, certainly in the U.S. For example, out here in South Africa, uh, I'm here and I'm, you know, yeah, I'm in the makeup room, in the wardrobe, trying things on and doing makeup tests and whatnot. And they know I'm a fighter. They, they hear about that before I come. And they, they've got so many questions because... It's it's not a big deal out here. Although you know, some people don't do know who I am. It's it's kind of weird walking down the street in South Africa and somebody beeps their horn and they're like, "Hey, Bisping," and you're like, "I'm in fucking South Africa. It's crazy." But that's the reach of the sport. But still, what the point I'm making is, it's still unknown in some territories now. Because I was explaining to somebody today in the US, it's massive, and you're right, it has kind of become. Um, like a family sport and that's because when it went on to Fox Sports that was the that was the deal changer the game changer part of me because you would go from sitting there watching you know um basketball baseball whatever the sport was then that would finish and boom on came the fights so you got legions of new fans and now of course it's gone one up and it's on ESPN. So now it's definitely, you know, up there with the big boys in terms of sports entertainment. So it is incredible. Um, you're right, but bare knuckle boxing has come out of nowhere. And I feel like eventually it will uh, disappear into obscurity again. That's just my bold prediction for this episode. But uh, I can't see this being sustained. I am intrigued, though, to know what the pain Paul in Malinaji. You know, he had a long, lengthy, uh, successful boxing career. He retired with a record of 36 and 8. Um, most of those losses came towards the end of his career. I'm just looking at his Wikipedia page. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, I would one would think that he would command uh, a healthy purse. Now, of course, from what I hear about bare knuckle boxing, is that they get a decent cut of the pay per view, and that's the only way they're attracting some of these fighters. And you know, for a guy like Malinaji and Artem, no wonder they're doing that. Like when I fought GSP. That was partly because partly part of the reason why I was going out there and I was trying to antagonize him so much. A, because he's just an easy target and I was having a great time. Maybe that's just because I'm a, you know, a bit of an asshole deep down. But B, because I'm trying to sell and hide the fight. So you gotta think what Artem and Malinaji are doing, it's it's all to help sell more pay-per-views. Uh, Mike, really quick, got to talk about Blue Chew to our fans. You guys have heard us talk about this for a while. Blue Chew is basically a performance enhancement drug for the bedroom. Same active ingredient as Viagra or Cialis. You guys have heard of those drugs. But this is a chewable little tablet. It tastes like fucking candy, which I love. Uh, and they make it easy. You don't have to go to the doctor. You don't have to have a weird conversation talking to the doctor about how you want your dick to work better. No. Simply as you go on the website, bluechew.com, you fill out a little questionnaire. They give you a prescription right online, and everything comes to your door in 
nice, discreet packaging. And I'm going to say right now, I use this regularly. I have a prescription. It was as easy as you could possibly be. It really does make sex a hundred times better. Better for me, better for my chick, better for everybody involved. The guy filming, yeah. the neighbors listening. It's great. Yeah, well, that was a little too much information. Uh, I now have a mental image, but... If you want a little enhancement, then this is the way to go. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, everybody wants to enhance things that are good. I mean, even world-class athletes, UFC fighters, they sometimes take performance-enhancing drugs, and they have no need to. I mean, look at Anderson Silva. Not only was he taking performance-enhancing drugs, he was taking dick pills, okay? Had he been taken, if he was really taking dick pills, um, and he took blue chew, he probably wouldn't have tested positive. Very okay, smart. so if you're in the UFC, then, you know, there you go. Uh, disclaimer, because that may not be true. But... If you do want to get involved, and as we say, everybody wants a little enhancement, it's very, very simple. As Lewis said, no need to go to the doctor. It will be delivered in discreet packaging. The tubules from Blue Chew are prescribed online by a doctor and made in the USA. And Blue Chew gives you confidence in bed every time. You and your partner are going to love it, so give it a try. Chew it da -da 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 -da, and do it. Okay, so here's what you got to do. Got a great deal for you. Visit bluechew.com and get your first order free when you use the promo code BELIEVE. Just pay $5 shipping. That's blue, B L U E, chew, C H E W.com. Bluechew.com. Promo code BELIEVE. Chew. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button with its notification bell and leave a comment in the comment box below of what you thought of the video and. Tune in for more on MMA News Outlet.